everybody! Welcome to A Case of the Jills. This week we're doing a question and answer video. I'm hoping that some of these questions might resonate with you and that they will help you in your journey to recover from hypothalamic amenorrhea and or overtraining syndrome. The first question came from someone who is at the initial stages of recovering from hypothalamic amenorrhea. She said that she has gotten her period back, but it has been 40 days and nothing is happening. She wants to know what can I expect in terms of seeing my cycle normalize when I first get my period back. This is a great, great question, and it is a question that a lot of women ask. You can expect the unexpected in the first few months right when you get your period back. Your period at this time may vary greatly with regard to duration, so it could be just a couple of days, up to seven, eight, nine days. It could be like a very long bleed. You could have varying cycle length, so it could be a very, very short, let's say 21 days, sometimes I've heard even less, all the way up to um, above 35 days, which is not the best situation, but it is something that does happen as you just start to get your period back. Right when you get your period back, it is possible for your body to, for you to actually bleed, but not have an ovulatory cycle. It does not mean that it will always be an ovulatory. And let's remember that we need to have ovulation. Ovulation is what signifies that the uh, female sex hormones are doing what they're supposed to be doing and that we're actually having a full hormone happy period that we want. All of this is normal for the first few months after you first get your period back, but it is certainly not normal long term. Some guidelines to remember that when you first get your period back, you really should not change anything about your exercise level or your diet for three months. Meaning, don't start adding exercise because you're super excited that you got your period back. Like, don't stop eating the bagels for breakfast and the like extra snacks during the day and all the fun things and enjoyable things that you've been doing. Don't stop your good nutrition. This is not the time to make any alterations. You just want to get your body to normalize. So you want to just keep with the good habits that actually got you to get your period back in the first place. The question of this person specifically is, you know, it's been 40 days and nothing is happening. So 40 days, technically speaking, no, it is not a great amount of time for a regular period cycle. But at this point, like I said, when you're first getting it back, it's it's sort of acceptable. The sort of concerning part about this question is that the person who asked it did express quite a bit of nervousness around the idea of maybe having to gain more weight in order to have a more regular cycle. I do understand this. There's no answer. There's no, nothing that is to say that if she gains five more pounds that her cycle is going to normalize, but there's nothing to say that maybe she's still not at a weight that makes her body happy and that gaining a little bit more is going to help her body normalize. Not to go down the rabbit hole too far on this topic, because it is very complex, but it is also normal to overshoot your weight at the beginning of this process. So right when you're getting your period back, lots of women find that they may end up at a slightly higher weight than they end up settling at. I know this was true for me. I know this is true for a lot of women, but you actually can't get to that point unless your body uh, has enough weight where it feels comfortable enough to continue to produce the hormones necessary to give you a period. You're gonna hear this theme repeating over and over again with me, which is that there's really no way around this. You kinda of have to gain the weight, you kinda of have to stop exercising, you have to eat well. This is the only way to do it. I know it's a little bit uncomfortable in the beginning, I've been there, but I promise you that things will normalize, your body will settle, and you'll feel like yourself again. And you'll be healthy. Moving on to question number two. This is a guy who emailed me and said that he's aware of the fact that he has massive overtraining syndrome. He's actually been to see a doctor who did tell him that it very much looks like overtraining. He has stopped running and training. He was a triathlete, and he's trying to recover. But his question is this, why am I experiencing painful, heavy, burning legs now that I've stopped running to recover from overtraining syndrome? I stopped about two weeks ago, but it seems to have gotten worse. Is this normal and what can I do? This is another one that I have firsthand experience with. This is very normal. If you've watched this channel for a while, you've heard me describe the feeling of walking upstairs and feeling like um, there was a hammer banging on my quadriceps. Also just sitting in a chair and feeling the muscles of my legs just squeezing and squeezing. I used to lay in bed and, and literally feel that my legs were on fire. This at the beginning stages of overtraining syndrome, recovery is pretty normal. This is a sign that your body is repairing itself. Remember those muscles have a lot of damage in them. There is going to be an inflammatory response to repair that tissue. You are probably gonna have inflamed swollen legs and that burning sensation is all a part of this. There is enormous amount of work that your body is doing 
to repair that damage and so it's gonna be a little bit uncomfortable at the beginning. You might also notice aside from this pain that you have an extreme amount of fatigue and that this fatigue is hitting you harder when you actually stop training. Also, this is normal. This is a sign that your body is no longer pumping itself full of stress hormones to keep it moving. By the way, those stress hormones are also what suppress the pain sensation and what fights fatigue. So once you don't have all of that uh, stress hormone coursing through your veins, your body can actually feel what it feels like, which is usually like a pile of poop. So the fact that you're actually feeling these sensations in your body is a really good sign. What can you do about this? The most important things you can do are eat well. Don't let your body get hungry at this point. Your body needs the fuel from the food that it takes in to repair the tissues. You must sleep. Sleep, as we know, is one of the most important things we can do. It is the time where all of our tissues and cells rejuvenate, and you cannot deprive yourself of sleep during this time at all. You really have to, even if it means you have to nap, just do it. Go for the nap, just do it. During this time when you have that pain, you might find that a little bit of gentle movement is helpful. This is when you're very easy stroll walking, like, I mean, like walking like an old person, walking with your dog, like walking with a toddler, just chill, relax and walk. Some gentle foam rolling might be helpful here. So not like where you like lay on it and you're destroying yourself, but like gentle foam rolling. You might also enjoy maybe getting a massage. You've got to take it easy on yourself here. Your body is, going through the tough spot to get to the good stuff, so let it be. Question number three also has to do with overtraining syndrome. This is another gentleman who wrote to me telling me that he does not wanna stop training despite the fact that he knows that he's suffering from overtraining syndrome. He says, if I eat a surplus of protein to heal my muscles, can I still continue to train? I don't want to stop. Well, wouldn't it be great if that were possible? If it was possible to just eat a lot of protein and heal your body, I'd be like Lady Gaga walking around in that meat dress. I really wish that this were possible. It seems like a really fun parallel universe to live in. Unfortunately, it's not true. Whatever you take in as a surplus, whether it's carbohydrates, fats, protein, whatever, whatever your body isn't using, it's going to eliminate through poop. The thing is, is that you cannot rush the healing process. Everyone's body is different. Everyone's gonna take differing amounts of times, but you cannot avoid the fact that your body needs to repair itself in order to get over overtraining syndrome. As you have heard me say many times before, you cannot train your way out of it. You need to rest your way out of it. Number four is a really interesting question, and I actually haven't talked about this for a while. The question came across about celiac disease or other autoimmune disorders and hypothalamic amenorrhea. The person asks, is there a link between celiac disease or autoimmune disease and hypothalamic amenorrhea? Is it possible that one can lead to the other? I could talk about this for hours. I really, really could. It's a super fascinating topic. Many of you know that I have celiac disease and obviously I had um, hypothalamic amenorrhea and I have talked about the link between the two in the past for me. So I'll talk about myself a little bit, but I wanna tell you about the sort of chicken and egg issue we have here with celiac or autoimmune. We're gonna just lump it into celiac right now and HA. In young people and young women, um, if you have untreated celiac disease, chances are there's going to be malabsorptions in the um, gastrointestinal system because the intestines are very damaged, so the nutrients from the food are actually not getting into the body. That malnutrition can lead to secondary amenorrhea, meaning that if there was a young woman who did have a period and then she lost it as a result of um, you know, malabsorptions of food and mal uh, undernutrition or malnutrition, yes, it is possible that she would lose her period due to that. In slightly older women who are of childbearing age and they are getting a period, However, they're having fertility struggles. So remember, they're getting a period, they're having fertility struggles. It has been shown that in about 4% of those cases, we might be able to count on an undiagnosed celiac disease or gluten sensitivity. So let's just make the distinction there. So we have young people with undiagnosed celiac disease leading to malnutrition, which could lead to secondary amenorrhea, or we have older women who do get a period but are infertile, and in 4% of those cases, we might be able to look at celiac disease or undiagnosed gluten sensitivity to point to as a reason for that. Then we have to go back the reverse way. So in celiac disease that is diagnosed, the dietary restrictions necessary to manage celiac disease, which uh, as you know, re involves removing all gluten from the diet. And uh, most people with celiac disease will have other food sensitivities or food allergies along with that due to the damaged nature of the intestinal lining. I myself have problems with lactose and a bunch of other foods that I don't even wanna deal with right now. Let's just say that 
it does require the person to remove a lot of types of food from the diet. If people are not educated as to what good substitutions may be in order to fortify their diets with appropriate nutrition, despite the fact of removing all this stuff, we might have a situation where that person is not eating enough and not eating enough of certain types of foods leading to an undernourishment or malnutrition and that may end up in secondary amenorrhea again. So me. You've probably heard my story a million times before, but you know as an ultra runner, I was not fueling adequately because I took all of the gluten out of my diet and didn't think to replace it with uh, adequate amounts of starchy carbohydrates. I also was definitely not eating enough calories in general and had a huge amount of fear around eating different foods because I was constantly thinking of the pain that they would cause. I do have a video about this that I call a uh, fear restriction that talks about the necessary restriction involved in managing celiac disease and how that affected me and also led to my issues with hypothalamic amenorrhea. You can take a look at that video if you'd like, I'll link it below. Okay, and the last point about this that I think it's important to recognize is that in cases where there is an extreme amount of stress, so not just mental stress, but mental and physical stress on the body, it is possible that the body can be put in such a poor state with regard to the immune system that the expression of certain autoimmune diseases may be encouraged. So let me just give you a little background on this. For example, I was diagnosed with celiac disease when I was 25 years old. During that time, I was living in a third world country and I had gotten very, very sick many times, which required multiple rounds of antibiotics. Um, I had lost 30 pounds in about a month and I was really, really sick. I also was just married to someone I shouldn't have been married to, ended up being a divorce. Let's not get into it. But it was a very stressful time in my life. So at the time I didn't know that it was celiac disease. I just knew that I was getting sicker and sicker. When I did finally get to see a physician to talk about whether or not I did have celiac disease and finally get tested, she explained to me that it is quite possible that the amount of physical and mental stress that my body was under led to a situation where those genes, which by the way, are it's genetic, so celiac disease is genetic, you're born with it, but it just hadn't expressed itself to that level in me because up until that point, my stress level wasn't enough to kind of really hit my immune system hard. So it is possible that stressful life situations and physical situations, let's say, um, you know, from getting really run down or really sick, like in my case, could kind of bring about the, the situation where you do have the expression of an autoimmune disease. Hopefully that helps to answer a little bit of the chicken and egg question about those two things. And um, I'm sure this is something we'll talk about more in the future too. It's a super interesting topic. Okay, question number five came from another person who asked me, how did you prepare mentally, physically, emotionally to commit to recovery? This is a great question. This is another thing that I could talk about for hours really. So again, if some of you have been watching my channel and have heard about my story of how, when, where, why I decided to try to recover from hypothalamic amenorrhea. When I finally hit the wall and was like, I can't do this anymore, I actually had already signed up to do the Rome Marathon on my birthday, and this was almost three years ago. Actually, yeah, my three year anniversary is coming up really soon. So part of my preparation was to actually come here to Italy to, to go do that marathon and celebrate it on my birthday. And uh, since I was turning a big round number on that birthday, it was a great moment for me to kind of give myself a fresh start. So I approached it, to be honest, as kind of a celebration, a chance for me to kind of get back to um, health, get back to myself and really get in touch with what I wanted to be and what my hopes and dreams were for health and, and the rest of my life. Some of the other things I did, which you've probably heard me talk about before, I started a Pinterest board. I love Pinterest. Uh, put tons of photos of women that embodied to me the vision of health that I hope to have for myself. I pinned articles there from different journals that I had been reading, just all kinds of silly motivational quotes and just anything that really made me feel hopeful and, and completed kind of a vision I had for what I wanted for myself. I did scroll through that board very often in the beginning when I was feeling nervous and it was really helpful to me. 
I started the Instagram account, A Case of the Jills, back then because I just needed a place to share my thoughts and my fears. I also did a lot of writing at that time, like painful teenage journal kind of writing and angsty. And I look back and I'm kind of laughing now, but it was really helpful for me. It was very cathartic to get my thoughts out. And finally, uh, something that was really, really helpful for me was to talk about it. I found that I had some friends that were willing to talk about it with me. Certainly my husband at the time was my boyfriend and he was so great about listening to all the things I had to say about it. If you have people to talk to, don't be afraid. Definitely get it out. It's really helpful to talk about it and share your thoughts and fears so they don't come up and bite you. You can email me if you want to. You can also give me a call. We can set up a mentoring call together if you just want someone to vent to. By the way, you can do all that stuff through acaseofthegills.com. Question number six says, how does one's culture affect the propensity to develop HA? Okay, this is interesting. Let's remember that HA is not a disease. HA, hypothalamic amenorrhea, is a condition. It's a condition that comes about as a result of many other factors. So I'm just gonna say this. In any culture that values thinness, fitness, or any type of physical ideal, in any culture that values this over the true value of a person, the risk is going to be incredibly high that people make poor decisions and don't do the right thing and end up with a situation where they are hormonally compromised. Wherever we have an unrealistic physical ideal and we tell women that they have to achieve this unrealistic physical ideal or they possibly may be devalued as a person, we're going to see people making choices to compromise their health in order to attain that ideal. And that's all I have to say about that. Okay, last question I saved for the end. It was a great question and it was something that I actually had to research and I'm really glad I did. The question is, can acetyl L-carnitine help me get my period back? All right, there are two studies that were done here in Italy in Modena. The name of the study you can actually look up online is called Acetyl L-carnitine as Possible Drug in the Treatment of Hypothalamic Menorrhea. This is by Genazzani et al. There's a whole bunch of other names that I'm just not gonna pronounce. Okay, so there were two studies that were done here. I'm, I'm not gonna go through the second study because both of them have kind of poor study design, but the second one, to me has a philosophical issue along with the study design that I totally disagree with and I don't think that um, it's worth discussing because essentially the findings are the same as the one I'm going to tell you about now. There were 20 women in this study and they were given L acetyl L-carnitine to help them get their periods back. These women did not have changes in their weight uh, for one calendar year prior to this research study. The problem with this, uh, there are many problems with this study, but one of the problems is that all of the women in the study were 5 to 9% below ideal weight for their height. And yes, you know what? It's true that about half the women did get their period back using acetyl L-carnitine as a supplement. I hate this so much. I don't even have enough words for how much I hate this. And here's the reason why. You've heard me say many times on this channel that I don't believe in hacks. I don't believe that there's any kind of thing that you can do to circumvent the actual hard work of eating more, exercising less to get your period back. It's not just a technical issue of eating more and exercising less. The fact of the matter is we need to understand that these are habits. Exercising too much and eating not enough are habits that we have been relying on as maladaptive coping mechanisms to get through something else. If you take a pill to fix the problem, you're taking a pill, you're not fixing the problem. So whether or not acetyl L-carnitine is helpful in getting your period back, it is not helpful to you. I truly believe that the best way to recover from HA is to learn how to rely on yourself. Learn how to rely on your intuition to make better decisions about your nutrition and exercise habits for the long term. Otherwise, in my experience dealing with women, talking about this stuff for years now, it's gonna come back. You're gonna have problems again. The only way to eliminate this problem from your life forever is to learn how to trust yourself to make the right decisions. Sorry for the hate on this one, I just have to keep it real. 
Okay, sorry this video was a little bit longer than normal, but I really wanted to make sure I got to all of the great questions that you asked. We'll definitely be doing more of these if you like them. Give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you don't mind very much to A Case of the Jills. You can follow me on Instagram. You can go to acaseofthejills.com where you will find all of the videos, you will find all of the blog posts. Thank you so, so much for watching today. I hope you have a wonderful day wherever you are and I will see you again soon.